Welcome to the Nonprofit Show. Thrilled to have you here with Julia Patrick and myself, Jarrett Ransom. Another episode here of the Nonprofit Show with our guest today, Kevin Holt. Kevin's going to talk to us about collaborating with another nonprofit. So before we jump into this conversation with you, Kevin, we want to remind our amazing viewers and listeners across the globe who they are seeing or possibly listening to. So again, Julia Patrick is here, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. I'm Jarrett Ransom, Julia's personal nonprofit nerd, but all of yours as well. There's plenty of nerdiness to go around, but I am the nonprofit nerd CEO of the Raven Group. We are so very honored to continue our partnership relationships with so many of our amazing esteemed presenting sponsors. Those of you watching, you can see their logos. Those of you listening, I'm going to give a verbal shout out to our friends over at Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Fundraising Academy at National University, Be Generous, Your Part-Time Controller, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, as well as the Nonprofit Nerd. We encourage you to check out these companies. They are with us every single day and a representative does come on every month to join us to share with you a little bit about their services and how they can help you and your mission. Hey, we've produced over 700 episodes wow. now. We're actually marching towards our fourth year. Wow. So thank you to all of you, our sponsors, our viewers, our guests. You can find all of our uh, archived epic episodes on Roku, YouTube, Amazon Fire TV, as well as Vimeo. And for those of you that are podcast listeners like myself, these are my little, you know, podcast buds in my ears. <laughs> you can listen to the nonprofit show wherever you stream your podcast. So Kevin, that's our intro. We do each and every episode. So glad to have you here in the hot seat. Kevin Holt of Co-Innovation Consulting. Welcome to you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You know, we have noticed such a push towards collaboration um, coming from funders. And so this is a really interesting conversation to have with you today, Kevin, because collaboration can be really sticky. It can be really challenging. And it seems to me that um, it's getting pushed in, in building uh, alignments that maybe might not have been there before. And so I can't mm -hmm. wait to hear how you um, advise and how you think about this. You also have, I have a copy of your book here, um, Differentiation Strategy, Winning Customers by Being Different. I have to admit, mine's a little dog-eared because I've been looking <laughs> at this and going back to it. That's um, good. <laughs> yeah, it's really an interesting approach, very scientific, a very exacting um, and so I can't wait to really have you talk about that. But before we dig in too far, help us understand what collaboration really is. Sure. Again, thanks for having me. Um, it's really pretty straightforward. Uh, collaboration, uh, uh, the way I define it, is that uh, it involves two or more entities uh, working together to produce or create something. Mm -hmm. And um, when you talk about those entities, uh, they can exist at several levels. There's uh, inter-organizational collaboration, which is a collaboration of two or more organizations. And that's the sort of collaboration uh, you were referring to that uh, so many funders uh, want to see uh, to get two or more nonprofits or two or more organizations generally um, to collaborate, to be more efficient or effective together. And then um, within those organizations, you have interfunctional or interdepartmental collaboration, which uh, you'll often hear the term uh, siloed organizations, which are organizations that aren't collaborating because everybody's working in their own silo. Dang. And then um, the third level and the level that interests me, and I'll explain why in a second, um, is interpersonal collaboration, which is collaboration between two or more people mm -hmm. uh, to produce or create something. And when you think about it, uh, inter-organizational, inter-departmental collaborations are typically implemented by team-sized groups, say six to 12 people, maybe more, maybe less. And so if 
they aren't collaborating well, well, then the sort of interorganizational collaboration that funders want um, isn't going to be working well. So, um, uh, you know, what I'm interested in is how you make those groups do a better job of thinking together, make them collectively smarter. I feel like there's a lot of collaborations, as you mentioned, Julia, in our community. And I'm curious uh, for this, Kevin, uh, are all collaborations formal or are they all informal? Or is there a little bit of mixture of kind of all of it? Good question. Uh, I, I, I'd say uh, both. And um, you have formal collaborations between organizations that uh, are written um, right. that uh, involve a written agreement. And it's very clear uh, what the purpose of the collaboration is and who is to do what to uh, uh, accomplish that purpose, or at least the, a formal collaboration should be that way. Mm -hmm. And then you have informal collaborations where two or more EDs might uh, work together to uh, jointly solve a problem, but there's really nothing written. So yeah. you have both. Yeah. You know, you you said something that I thought was magical and you used that phrase thinking together. Mm -hmm. which I love that. I mean, that that really to me is a collaborative spirit and approach. And you identify this in three ways, thinking together about process, platforms and people. So let's have you dig in to this first and foremost with collaboration and process. What does that mean? Okay. Um, and before I get into that, let me just emphasize that uh, when you talk about thinking together, um, when a group is really working well, when it's using process platform and people well, it's able to think of ideas that uh, no one of the group members previously possessed or could have thought of uh, on their own. Yeah. So the group is literally thinking of ideas that would not be thought of if they uh, weren't working well together. And that, that's what really uh, floats my boat when it comes to collaboration. So um, when we talk about uh, the process aspect of collaboration, um, the uh, the general idea here is that you want there to be some method to your madness. You don't want to use the uh, what I like to call the BOPSAT method, which is uh, acronym for a bunch of people sitting around talking, and there's really no <laughs> process or reason or approach being taken. Mm -hmm. So um, processes uh, you can generally divide them into two types. You have group processes, which uh, determine how the group members will interact and in what order. And then you have task processes, which mm -hmm. outline the steps that the uh, uh, group will take to accomplish some task. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, an example of a group process is, and uh, most of these group processes are designed to make the group collectively more intelligent to do a better job of thinking together by mining each other's minds, brains. Um, so um, one method is called the nominal group technique or method. And it uh, recognizes the fact that research shows that uh, surprisingly, because we all have these brainstorming, use these brainstorming groups that an initial set of ideas is uh, better developed when you have people working alone. Uh, but, then once you get those initial ideas on the table, the group is better at developing them. So with the nominal group method, uh, what you do is you start with having everybody list their ideas silently, write them down on paper, and then you go around the group, uh, round robin style, and each person contributes their idea, and the, then the group comments on it. So then, you say that that's like pre-work? Like I know a lot of times when we we – we join together, especially in board leadership, or we start some of these processes, we will be given what we call pre-work and it's kind of like come to the table. So so it's a little bit more um, thoughtful as opposed to putting somebody on the spot or is that is that part of the secret sauce is having everybody kind of put on the spot? No, uh, that's a great question. Um, and in fact, it's even better to do the, have the people list their ideas 
um, before the meeting, uh, do that pre-work, and then you can actually start uh, creating themes and sorting the ideas into themes before the meeting even starts, which gives you a jump on the process. Mm -hmm. um, so great, great, uh, great question. Then um, a, a more sophisticated version of the nominal group method is called the one, two, four, all method. And um, this does a better job of getting individuals to mine each other's minds to think together. So you start off with that initial list of developed either in pre-work or at, at the meeting. Mm -hmm. And then you have the group members pair up groups of two. That's the one, two. Mm -hmm. um, and they work together to develop the ideas. And then you have the pairs pair up. So okay. you have groups of four. And the groups of four work to create, develop their ideas. And then finally, each group of four report, reports out to the entire group um, and the entire group uh, develops their ideas. I was laughing when you said one, two, four. I was like, that sounds like how I do math. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> one, two does not equal four. And then we have the all encompassing. Um, and I, I feel like this is probably used a lot. This is a technique I use, honestly, Kevin. Um, great, in my, great. Yeah, in my, well, I didn't know that this is what it was called, but in a lot of the training and board development and strategic planning work that I do, I love, you know, bringing in, um, you know, people's thoughts and, you know, kind of having these conversations of, of process. Um, so you talk about how best to collaborate in these three ways and you have process platform, and then you have people, right? And so right. the one, two, four, it's not, it's not just how I do math, but it is this, <laughs> <laughs> it is this, um, you know, process. Oh, I do it. <laughs> Right. Plus, I, I joke and I say sometimes my calculator doesn't even give me the right number, you know. <laughs> so, um, OK, so so talk us through then. Um, so is, the, is that the process piece? I was curious. So uh, well, then uh, the other half is task processes. Task. And uh, a task is a uh, example of a task is creating a strategic plan. Mm -hmm. So you should use a process for creating that plan. And for example, the process I describe in my book is a process for creating what's known as a uh, differentiation strategy, which is one type of competitive strategy. So again, you want some method to your madness. You don't want to use the BOPSET method. BOPSET method. Um, then other examples are like scenario planning is a process for doing foresight, for uh, talking about uh, possible futures that might unfold. And they're really interesting is there's a, a a whole battery of innovation methods that people should be aware of. Uh, for example, uh, there's one called the jobs to be done method. Uh, there's consumption chain method. Uh, there's journey mapping and touch point analysis. And all of these involve steps to accomplish a task. Mm -hmm. You know, it's an amazing thing to, to think about moving from just okay, let's work together to how we work together and understanding how we can navigate more successfully. The next piece of, of your, if you will, P your is platform. Collaboration and platform. What does that mean, the platform aspect? All right. Uh, when I talk about platforms, I'm talking about uh, uh, technological platforms. Mm -hmm. And... Um, uh, one of my main messages here is that the uh, uh, flip chart is as obsolete as the buggy whip uh, with all these new wonderful collaboration technologies that you have out there. And so the idea is that you want to map the process, uh, group and task process that uh, you're using to one of the, uh, to a collaboration platform. Um, and the one that uh, I use most and what really actually got me interested in this whole topic of uh, getting groups to do a better job of thinking together is called electronic brainstorming, which, uh, despite its somewhat goofy name, um, is a technology, a groupware technology that was largely developed by uh, a collaboration between the University of Arizona and IBM. Wow. And it uh, is basically, you might imagine it as being, and by the way, it works both face-to-face -face and online. When face-to-face, -face, I bring in computers uh, for people to use. Um, and 
Um, so it works both face to face and online. And you might imagine it as being like um, uh, nobody really understands it till they use it, which is frustrating <laughs> for me. But uh, the b best way to describe it is uh, you might imagine it being like a large electronic whiteboard. And at the top of the board, you have the question like, well, what are all the things that are threats to our organization? And then everybody can type in their answers. And um, that. Uh, th then they all pop up on the whiteboard in the order they were entered, which is a lot faster than, say, going around the room with a flip chart saying, well, mm -hmm. Julia, what do you think? And you write it down. And Jarrett, what do you think? You write it down. So you can literally capture dozens of ideas in minutes. And in fact, I actually use it in ballroom settings where it's really gets overwhelming where you have... 100 200 people all <laughs> do you ever have a question on that do you ever have any crisis communication where you're like okay who wrote that where it's like a 12 year old little boy that like just had access to it and wanted to say something and then you're like oh gosh that should not have gone on the digital board usually no i usually well once i've had occasions where there were some politics going on and oh, I part of part of being a meeting facilitator i learned the hard way is that uh, you're sort of the the conduit through which the conflict occurs so uh, you'll get people that make comments like that but usually like i'll start with a practice question like you know name three things you had for breakfast this morning and you'll get an answer like coffee and cigarettes you know um <laughs> Things like I do a lot of hotel meetings and they'll all talk about Paris Hilton. That always comes up or yeah, used to. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so you, so you get that. But anyway, these ideas all pop up on the board and then you can create categories or like buckets on the fly um, and then drag and drop the ideas into the buckets so you can very quickly organize them. And then it has a whole bunch of very sophisticated voting tools for either selecting uh, one or more ideas or rank ordering them. Um, and uh, much more, uh, uh, much better at taking advantage of a group's judgment than just a simple show of hands. Right. Now, so, about, sorry to interrupt, Kevin, what is the investment for a technology platform like that? Yeah, that was my, my next question, yeah. Uh, it's uh, 5,000 a year for the one I use and, um, um, I don't know what the other guys are charging these days, but it's not cheap. Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, and then of course, if you're going to do the, uh, uh, bring computers in yourself, you need to have a projector and buy 20 computers, laptops and all mm -hmm. that. So, you know, um, it's, really, it's an interesting way to, um, actually make people more comfortable with the concept of collaboration because I don't know about you, Jarrett, but it seems to me that you're, you oftentimes in a group, we'll get a, a group of people and we'll, we want to talk about this next, but people that are like, yeah, I've been in these exercises. I understand the process. And then you have others that have not. And so they're intimidated or they're not versed in the process. And so it's, how do you get, you know, this um, equilibrium set, I guess. And so that kind of brings me to the next issue. And that's of your three P's, you had collaboration and people. And obviously this is a really cursory look at this. Um, you know, with, with the, the nonprofit show, we only have so much time, but I wanna make sure, Kevin, that we get you to help us to understand how we factor in, the, I guess, you know, the human element, and that is the people. Sure. Um, well, before I, I mention that, let me, uh, you say, you know, people are reluctant to speak up or uncomfortable. Um, and these three Ps all work together in a way that you can implement the nominal group technique on the technology and then uh, electronic brainstorming. Um, and then the technology also uh, addresses some of the people issues in that you can enable anonymous entry. So if you have people who are reluctant to speak up, mm -hmm. um, their name isn't, uh, uh, you can set it up so no one's name is next to it. Mm -hmm. But um, on the people part then, um, so you've, you're using the right processes, you've mapped it to one or more uh, collaboration platforms. The electronic brainstorming is just one. Um, 
And uh, the third part is then that you want uh, to have a meeting facilitator facilitate the meeting. Mm -hmm. And it's the job, that's the people part, or that's a person. Mm -hmm. And then it's the job of the facilitator to bring the right people to the table and have them engage in the right behaviors. So if we go back to the uh, uh, jigsaw puzzle idea where, uh, you know, if a group, uh, if you have all the people that, you need all the people that have the right pieces of the puzzle to create a, a completed solution or a, a novel idea. Mm -hmm. Well, so the job, one of the jobs of a meeting facilitator is to make sure that you have all the right people there to, uh, contribute their pieces to the puzzle. You want all the right pieces there. And a good example of that is like the obesity epidemic where uh, it, there are biological factors, there are psychological factors, there are social factors, economic factors, marketing factors that all bear on resolving or coming up with a solution to the obesity epidemic. So you want all those people at the table. Mm. But that's only half the battle. Um <laughs> So once you have all those people at the table, you want the them engaging in the right behaviors, which brings us back to something you mentioned earlier, which uh, there isn't one meeting I've ever done where you didn't have one or two people that uh, want to dominate the discussion, hog all the airtime. Um, and so if you're trying to complete that jigsaw puzzle, you want this collectively intelligent group you know, creating this really novel solution that has all the pieces fit together, but there's only one or two people doing all the talking. Well, nobody else gets to contribute their piece. Mm -hmm. And then the opposite problem is people who are a little reluctant to speak up. Mm -hmm. um, so you need to draw them out. Again, the technology like electronic brainstorming with anonymous entry helps to do that. Mm -hmm. So the people element is use a meeting facilitator, and that facilitator should help to bring the right people to the table and have them engaging in the right behaviors. Right. Yeah. And, and you had mentioned like it's only half of the puzzle of bringing in the people yes. to the conversation. Now it's eliciting their response, getting their participation. One of the things we've heard, Julia, um, is, you know, for board members in particular, new board members, it takes them on average about a year and a half before a board member feels very comfortable and confident in asking questions, being part of the conversations. And so, you know, it's like, okay, how do we make that people process happen quicker? And I don't know, you know, some of these elements, as you've mentioned, Kevin, and thank you for bringing the technology piece. I think that has definitely helped us in the third P of the process platform and people uh, portion as another P. <laughs> right. Well, I, you know, to answer your question, how do you do that? Um, I really believe that everybody in a group, especially one that meets routinely like that, should be trained in meeting facilitation. So they're aware of the behaviors and they're helping the facilitator who's, you know, up there all by himself, all by his lonely trying to manage all this. You know, they can chip in and say, you know, John, why don't you let Mary speak up a little bit. They should know about these behaviors and be, and to do that, they need to be trained in meeting facilitation. So, yeah. well, I, I have to tell you, I, I've, I've been, you know, involved with a lot of uh, training. Uh, I've been involved with a lot of kind of group thought and, and, and leadership issues. That's really hard to do. You know, that's really hard to do. And it seems to me, this reinforces the whole need for that meeting facilitator. And I think in, in the nonprofit sector, we're so reluctant to spend money. We're like, okay, yeah, well, we'll let, you know, this person do it, or we'll let that person do it. But the, don't you think, Jared? I mean, just oh, I think, see this all the time. Yeah. yeah. And I hear from boards, they'll say, well, you know, so-and-so on our board can do this. They do strategic yeah. plans for other, you know, other places. And you're right, Julia, I always come back and say, you really want to keep it agnostic, right? Like right. you want to make sure to Kevin's point, all voices are heard, all individuals are speaking up. And it's like, we all hold on to puzzle pieces. We all have them. Like, so the last thing we need is our corner pieces to not be into the puzzle <laughs> because we're not going to get that final image. Yeah. Um, right. 
So, yeah, this is so important as we move forward into the new year, you know, as we as we are having this conversation, it's almost the middle of January. What are you seeing, Kevin, going forward in this collaboration space, in particular for our nonprofit communities? Well, um, I I think the the biggest trend is that funders are are really pushing uh, the need for this. Um, But um, uh, I guess, you know, if I have the one message here today, it's that, um, you know, the next step is to um, help these uh, nonprofits make that collaboration happen, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, with the three P's, with, um, you know, one thing I've been wanting to develop, I'm working on doing an uh, online innovation lab, I'd love to be able to do a physical innovation lab, which is a space that is equipped with um, all these technologies and tools that are wonderful technologies and tools that are out there. Um, So, you know, funders could really help nonprofits by uh, funding innovation labs, uh, places where they can go to really be much more uh, effective. You know, I am so glad to hear you say this, and I'm also really glad to know that there are some funders in particular in our community, Julia, that are funding these collaborations and funding actually the um, the process of oh, yeah, viability, right, you know, yeah. the exploration stage yeah. to say, Hey, we will fund this exploration with a facilitator, professional facilitator, right. and you can kind of plot out, does this collaboration make sense? What are your strengths? Where are your gaps? You know, where can you really build synergy to better support the community? Well, you know, um, one of the things you can do like in these innovation labs, um, one of the methods, if you really want to go uh, full on, is you bring together 20 or 30 participants who have expertise, and then you have multiple facilitators. Right. Um, you have uh, people who are, are really expert in these issues. You have the funders in the room, right. and there is a, a whole innovation lab process you can use uh, where people form around small groups around the issues mm-hmm. um, and um, um, the you know the experts really stimulate uh, their thinking the facilitators once they break into the smaller groups there's a facilitator for each small group to make sure it's functional um, and uh, this has been used in uh, academics uh, for coming up with fundable research ideas. The the National Science Foundation um, funds these kinds of innovation labs. Well, this has been amazing. I want to make sure that um, we give everyone access to Kevin Holt's Co-Innovation Consulting information. His website is coinnovationconsulting.com. Check out um, his new book, too, because it's a really interesting way of understanding how we can look at things um, in, a, in a different way, in a more holistic way, kind of getting outside of ourselves, so to speak, um, and understanding how we have more strength when we, when we bring our different parts to the table. Um, it's been really exciting, Kevin, to have you here to talk about this. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Been joined today by my trusty nonprofit nerd, who, if you were with us in the green room, she <laughs> saved me yesterday from a major smishing situation. Yes. yes, put that cape on. I know, it's on. I'm wearing it proudly. Dun, da, da, da. Dun, da, da, da. You totally saved me, Jarrett Ransom. She is the nonprofit nerd. More importantly, I don't put the and I, and if you've noticed, she's been wearing glasses. I'm just saying. I know, you know I know, and I know. these are real. <laughs> I, know. I love and these are real. Hey, and again, we want to thank all of our presenting sponsors who make these episodes of the Nonprofit Show possible. Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller. Be generous. Fundraising Academy at National University. Staffing Boutique. Nonprofit Thought Leader and the Nonprofit Nerd. Wow, this has been great. I really appreciate, Kevin, that you took time to kind of help us understand how maybe some of us can achieve our goals of collaboration in the new year. 
Thank you. Great. Well, thank you again for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Another episode of the Nonprofit Show. As we end today, we want to remind everyone to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here tomorrow, everyone.